Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas, day one of HP Discover here on the ground. This is theCUBE's coverage. I'm John Furrier, your host, but Dave Vellante, my co-host. We also have Rebecca, Rebecca Knight here. We're getting all the action. We got Intel on the set here. I want to thank them for being involved with theCUBE. Really appreciate it. We got Ryan Tabrot here, Vice President, General Manager of the Xeon Product Family Product Management. Ryan, thanks for coming on theCUBE. And uh, I see we got a little show and tell there. We'll get to the processor, but thanks for coming on. No, I appreciate it. It's great to be here. So everybody wants smaller, faster, cheaper processors. Lower power. Lower power, more <laughs> performance. And we're in an era now where, you know, it's, we're back to the old fun days of more horsepower enabling change with software now data. Obviously Gen AI is showing that. So there's a real appetite and, and hunger for more power, more horsepower. Yeah, I actually think it's um, a seminal moment in the industry where uh, we have this insatiable desire for power. You know, it's, it's all about the race to like, how much compute can you fit into a square block of cement? And so there's this, uh, there's this demand for, hey, I have a lot of general compute, and can I, it's really about power density. So it's not just per, per watt, it's about power density. And what does that mean for customers? Uh, how can they use that to transform yeah. their next generation uh, data centers if they're building brand new ones or their existing infrastructure. So a lot of data centers out there in areas that they can't grow anymore and can I drive more compute into those data centers? And, and how much of this demand do you feel like, if you had to do a blame pie, is because of the AI awakening versus just sort of natural progression? You know, it was already naturally happening before this because of, uh, I, would, I would say, almost like the social media advent, the media, uh, uh, media transcode, a lot of different workloads were kind of driving us that way. But recently, because of AI, the speed in which customers have to address this power problem is, uh, I don't know, it, it's probably exacerbated at 10x, 20x. Because I, I want to push on this a little bit because I got so many PCs, but I, I don't really care about buying a new PC every year, but now I do. I saw all these AI PCs announced this year, and, and I, I, I see the depreciation cycles of the, the cloud vendors on their servers, like they're up to six years now. My prediction is that's going to change because we, we're going to need the latest and greatest. Now maybe they'll Maybe the training server will become the inference server. I don't know, maybe you'll keep them around for other stuff, but I'm going to want the latest and greatest now like I never have before. Same thing with my smartphone. Do you buy that premise that, that things are happening faster, cycles are going to compress? They are, and I think the industry is, is changing. I mean, we've been working with HPE on DC MHS. It's a new standard where you modularize your uh, server platforms, and so uh, the new servers that HPE is announcing today with uh, our new Intel Xeon 6 processors, the ProLiant 12th generation servers, are based on that foundation. So you can imagine in the future, as customers customize and order their servers, they can pick and choose different vendors for networking, backplane, and other aspects, including the compute module. But then you can imagine, too, sustainable-wise, that you can go and upgrade with future generations of a similar platform uh, out in time without having to rip and replace the entire server. So lift and, lift and not lift and shift, rip and replace is dead. Has, it, has been this eventually, model. Yeah, yeah, eventually. But I, I do think there's going to be a, a giant move over because of AI. I mean, we, we talk about uh, most people today are are running on Intel Xeon Gen the second gen, which is like Cascade Lakes. So we talk about how if you're transcoding video and maybe you have 200 servers in Iraq doing all that transcoding, you can take now 66 of these and replace those 200 servers and save a megawatt of power. And okay. so you, could, you can reuse that power, that space, for growing your AI footprint, you can invest in other areas of your data center, and it just unleashes the potential of your existing data centers or your future data centers. And this is a Xeon 6. This is a Xeon 6. Can we talk about this? Yeah. Can we like, zoom into that and get yeah, a good so, look at it? Yeah, so, okay. so two weeks ago, we, we proudly launched our first Xeon 6. This is our Xeon 6 with E cores. We have two variants, an E core and a P core. This is our efficiency core. And so what this is dedicated towards is the web services, uh, kind of uh, containerized workloads that are just uh, out of the box, easy button, saves customers a lot of money. They have a bunch of general compute running. Uh, a lot of customers have customer facing apps. They have uh, APIs uh, that they need to monetize. And those workloads uh, tend to be more dispersed. 
and you need to be able to, 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 be able to feed uh, the speeds of all your customers and your connectivity points, maybe your storage head nodes, your network head nodes, you want to consolidate that. You want to, you want to drive it into a higher density of compute and uh, that's why we launched this. It's, uh, it, we've gotten great response from customers. Uh, working with HPE, we pulled in uh, the availability of their platform, uh, and uh, we're excited for customers to get their first samples. Ryan, back up, zoom out for a minute on the, Z, on the Xeon 6 for a minute, because you know, one of the things that we're seeing is end-to-end -end workloads, also flexibility in the type of workloads. Um, people have been talking about the 6 as being flexible in that way. You mentioned E-Cores, which stands for what? Efficient cores, yes. more energy. So this, there's a P-Core and an E-Core. Can you explain the, the Xeon 6, what those two things mean and why, and, and does that address the flexibility challenge? Yeah, it's, it's really not just flexibility. We call it elasticity. So it's that, hey, you're building your data center for 2025. You actually don't know all the type of workloads you have to run. And so, if you have a modular uh, server box and you have a modular infrastructure around Xeon 6, you can now kind of late binding decide how much of the performance core, which is the highest performance per thread, you know, so super HPC, AI focused type of workloads, down to your general compute workloads, which needs a lot more efficiency, you can now have the elasticity to kind of like choose how many of whichever in your data center later on versus having to choose today. And the TAM for E-Core is, is larger than P-Core or how do, you, how do you size them up? You know, it, it, it's hard to uh, exactly quantify it. Uh, maybe uh, 12 months ago, I would have said it'll be a slow run, maybe you know, out in time to be 20 or 30%, eventually being like 50% of where compute's going. Um, for AI, e. Yeah, for, for the E-Core, uh, but you know, uh, the consolidation of power in the data center and the squeeze of AI, as I call it, is forcing a lot of customers to look at their existing software, looking at their existing workloads, and they're like, hey, how can I consolidate this piece of my infrastructure to make more power room? And so we, we actually have a, a growing segment of customers that maybe it would have been second or third gen that they would have moved over, but they're being forced to now, but it's actually solving a real problem for them, right? a big TCO problem. We're seeing a lot of clustered right. systems around the silicon, people are packaging it differently, it's not just about the, the processor, it's what's around it, uh, Ethernet, InfiniBand, all these people are talking about all kinds of new systems, it's a systems game, right? That's right. So the question I have for you is, one of the things that comes up in this kind of like combining chips together, like chips and wine, what serves, what goes best with each other, what, the big conversation is, I got a lot of I.O. going on, and I have memory around the, the, the chips. How does the Xeon handle memory and I.O.? What's the uh, innovation there? Anything notable you want to share? Is, or does that rely on something else? How does that take no, us no, through? No, you're right. So if you, uh, if you look at this design, um, there's actually three visible chiplets on there, and, and the two kind of like uh, on the big bar on there, like the, the, the longer ones, are actually the I.O. die. That's on our Intel 7, uh, node and the CPU tiles on our Intel 3 node. Uh, that shares the same I.O. tile as all of our other variants in Xeon 6. What that does is it simplifies validation and it allows customers like HPE to save time and money bringing it to market. So now as they go out to market with our Xeon 6 with E cores or P cores, they have to, they can just go to market a lot faster because it's the same IO tile. All the hard stuff's taken care of. And this IO tile now has uh, some of the fastest memory speeds with DDR6. Um, and it also supports some of the latest and greatest uh, PCI Gen bus speeds, and so that allows people to have higher throughput platforms, and again, being able to modularize if you want a P or E core, it allows customers to have elasticity for their different types of workloads. What about tokens and, and uh, AI workloads? Does that help there? I'm assuming inference is strong with that, how would you? Yeah, you know, um, the E core uh, variant, or Sierra Forest was the code name, um, isn't primarily set for that type of industry. That's our P core variant. And okay. you know, we have a lot of customers using our, uh, uh, our current gen Xeon 5 and then going to uh, Xeon 6. Uh, they're gonna, they, they can expect almost a 2.53x speed on okay. just inferencing and, and AI workloads on the CPU without having to add a bunch of accelerators and then leaving you more room to do more stuff on your accelerator. So it's really more architectural which chip you use. Yes. I guess that brings up the question which I was trying to get to which is how has the AI workload or AI pressure changed your Xeon roadmap has it changed in any way? What things could you share around either priorities or doubling down or maybe abandoning a direction or is there, or is it you guys been on this 
on, on the whole time? No, that's a great question. I think the speed, the, the speed of innovation and the speed that customers demand is insatiable. And so um, we pulled in, we pulled in this launch of this product, we pulled in uh, our next gen. Uh, we're looking to pull in um, the next version that'll be socket compatible with this, yeah. our, our second gen Clearwater Forest. And it's all tied to our five nodes in four years where uh, you know, our CEO is driving the innovation starting at the node level and the manufacturing side so that that materializes in the product and people see the actual TCO and return on investment. And so this is a representation of our third node. Our second gen Clearwater Force will be the fifth node and that's coming out uh, later next year. So, I mean, we're excited about it. Oh, that's and, awesome. and, and that will be that's 18A? That's 18A, yeah. It'll be the first what? Neon on 18A, be the first product on 18A, and it'll be the first uh, major Xeon using the, the Angstrom era. With, with ribbon FET and backside power, yes. is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, when I heard five no's in four years, I was like, four no's in five years, they'll never get there. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I, I flipped it, and I was like, that's going to be really hard. But you've done five no's in four years. So of course, I didn't realize that the, the interesting packaging I'll call them tricks. They're more than tricks, magic that you were <laughs> going to play, but amazing. Uh, and then and then you said that the, the I.O. was seven process? Yeah, Intel and the, seven, yes. And, yeah. and the CPU was three. Intel three, correct. Awesome. So all, you're going to see in the future that the chiplet technology allows you to intersperse and choose the right node for the right technology. And we're excited about the market uh, embracing this. We're excited about having customers uh, innovate with us uh, and as we go to market with them, it'll build out new products. I mean, this product was built with definitional customers, like big definitional customers, and it's built an amazing product that right. the rest of the industry can now use. Yeah, the chiplet right. piece, the right. chiplet piece, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't predict, and that was really genius. And <laughs> and and so now, so 18A. And, and the target time frame for that process is? That, uh, so um, I, we're already in, so uh, silicon's already coming through the factory right now. Um, we just announced, uh, I think uh, two weeks ago, that uh, 18A is still healthy and we're having yes. products start coming out. So we're, we're expecting to power on our next variation of our forest line uh, very soon, uh, in the next couple of months, and then we expect to go to market as soon as possible next year. So, you know, it, and it'll be a 30% boost over what we're already delivering on this with, from a per, per watt standpoint. And you are the volume driver for your friends at Foundry, right? Yeah, absolutely. So they thank yeah. you for that. No, no, they're, they're my dear friends. Yeah, and, no doubt. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, we're, we're interwoven with our success, and, and I appreciate everything they do. And then 14A is going to like blow people's minds. That's, that's the plan. <laughs> That's the plan. Right, well, we're rooting yeah. for you. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Right. No, delivering value from the silicon to the workload to the data center is absolutely in our DNA. And uh, you know, we're just, uh, we're, we're thankful to be working with great partners like HPE to, to take it to market. So, you know. Brian, I want to thank you for coming on theCUBE. I'll give you the last word. Obviously, HPE is a big customer of yours. What's the impact of the innovation you guys are coming out with for their customers, for their customers that are watching? What's this mean for them? and what's going to be their benefit? You know, I think that uh, their, their customers are going to be excited about just the out of box, easy button experience they're going to have of saving power and money in their infrastructure. And again, having that elasticity that starts uh, not only with the chiplet design, but also extends through uh, the design of the box yeah. and the design of their own data centers. So workloads will yeah. drive uh, the software, the software will drive how the data center is built, the data center will build, will drive how the rack is built, which yeah. then we just have to have the products there that un unleash all of these customers' innovative ideas to use AI yeah. for uh, awesome things. Low, low, more performance, lower energy, dream scenario. And, the, getting, rid the of, and, and getting rid of forklift upgrades, that's, <laughs> that's critical, right? Because yeah, if the absolutely. cycles are going that much faster. It, it makes it more sustainable. Yeah. You know, we, we, yeah. we need a brighter future for us and we, yeah. we can't use all the power in the world, right? So. <laughs> well, looking forward to having you back on theCUBE. Love, love this conversation. A lot of innovation from Intel with Xeon 6, eCores. This is theCUBE. We're bringing you all the innovation here from day one. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante and Rebecca Knight. We'll see you tomorrow.